Hey, 4C Divers, thank you for tuning in. It is Facebook Live. All right, it is October 27th, 2022, and you know me, I'm Nicole, I'm your 4C social media gal, and we have Gabe Jensen as our guest presenter. Everyone say hi, Gabe. <laughs> Write it in the comments section, give him a hello. Tell us where you're listening in from. We like to know these things and give us a nice big smiley emoji or a thumbs up emoji or a heart emoji. Hit those buttons. Let us know you're enjoying tonight's presentation. And uh, we always, always love um, to see comments about um, anything that you're seeing on the presentation or questions that you might have. So just type those in there and uh, we will try and answer them as best as we can. Um, and I'm going to let Gabe um, start in just a second, but let's check in. As you can see behind me, it is Tech Month. Tech Month at 4C. October is Tech Month. So if you are not a tech diver and thinking about getting into tech diving, we have classes. We have um, all types of resources to give you the information to learn more about it. If you're already a tech diver, come out. Let's do some tech dives. Let's get you some uh, gear. We're always um, excited to talk to tech divers. So come into any of our stores and we will uh, get you out there to go diving. Guys, I don't know if you saw the post earlier today, but man, it was gorgeous today. Flat, calm, beautiful water. If you want to get out there and go diving, give us a call. We'll get you booked. Also, Blue Heron Bridge, visibility and no jellies. Woohoo! So if you guys want to get out and do the bridge, uh, we have about 20 foot of viz and um, nice, beautiful water. Um, all right, guys, if you are new to our Facebook Live, we have a raffle at the end of this. It's free. All you have to do is go over to www.force-e.com, go to that tab, go to the events, click it, find tonight's presentation, fill out your name and email, and you have to do that by 645, and we'll be giving out some air fills so that you can go out and find new to ranks. All right. So, all right, everyone's saying hello. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're super excited. This is a presentation I've actually never done this topic. I have never done the topic of nudibranchs. Um, and so I found one of the my favorite local photographers. He's featured on a lot of our Instagram social media posts. Um, and I asked him if he would do this topic because somehow he has the eye for it. I do not. I can never find these things, but he can. And he is going to tell you how to do that. So appropriately, we named tonight's uh, talk nudie diving. <laughs> All right, Gabe, are you ready? I'm ready. All Let's right, I'm going to go ahead. And, awesome. I'm going to go ahead and bring in your PowerPoint and you can start. Sounds great. How's it going, everyone? Um, First, a little introduction. My name is Gabe Jensen, and uh, I am far from an expert on this topic, but I have been studying how to find nudibranchs uh, here in South Florida for a few years now, and um, they are just an absolute joy for me to find. And so when Nicole asked me, hey, can we do kind of like a Halloween trick-or-treat, candy-colored uh, jewels on the reef thing, I was like, yes, we can. Let's do it. Um, so, uh, today's presentation is how to find sea slugs in South Florida. And this is going to be, um, I'm going to give you some basic tips that you can go and like nearly hundred percent go and find a sea slug on your next dive, because once you know them, you can find them. It's awesome. Uh, if you want to see any more of my work after this is done, you can check me out on Instagram on uh, shallows at shallow seas gallery, or um, you can also check out, I'm on the board of the South Florida underwater photography society. Uh, if you, if this interests you and taking pictures of these interests you some more, please check out www.sfups.org. So uh, let's get started. So you don't need to fly to the Pacific Ocean to go find sea slugs. I hear it all the time. The only place you can go see sea slugs is out in the Pacific, or I've been diving here for a lot of years and I don't see sea slugs. Um, and I'm gonna equip you here with uh, 
kind of four main tips or I guess four sections here where uh, we're going to go in blah, blah, four sections uh, of tips to help you find slugs. So number one is the skills, the kind of techniques that you'll need to use to find them. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the specific kind of microbiomes that they're going to live, especially on South Florida shore dives. So I'm talking Lauderdale by the sea, the Blue Heron Bridge, um, you know, any of the shore dives throughout Broward and Palm Beach counties, down through the Keys as well. Uh, on the, I guess, left-hand side of my screen here, I have a juvenile, uh, Felimar Ruthe, and, uh, this is a fun, a fun little guy. Uh, there's currently a ton of them at the Blue Heron Bridge, and this is a juvenile, and he's maybe just uh, four millimeters long, and you can see the individual hydroids that he's feeding on, so he gets nice, big, and strong. I hear this all the time. I have never seen a sea slug, and um, it kind of makes me a little bit sad. Uh, Sea slugs are amazing, and they're such a common sight on these dives now. And uh, it just it's just a matter of putting some of these tips into practice. Um, you don't need to be a diver to find these sea slugs. A lot of them are found in snorkel depth, so less than three feet, less than one foot of water sometimes. And uh, there's a couple reasons why they're difficult to find um, here in the here in the Atlantic. Uh, the first one is that um, compared to the Pacific Ocean, we have about 400 species or a little bit more of sea slugs in the, in the tropical Northwestern Atlantic. And uh, in the Pacific or in, in the, you know, kind of Western Pacific, uh, there's more than 3,000 species of nudibranchs. So there's just simply less different species and less niches that they're filling in. Um, and I, to the left of my screen here, I have a picture of, they're not, uh, they're not quite sea slugs. They're in the snail family. Um, these two different species of, uh, flamingo tongues, the fingerprint flamingo tongue and the standard flamingo tongue, uh, in the same picture here, just a picture of biodiversity, I guess. Additionally, the sea slugs that are here, even though they might be um, similar to those in, two, in both oceans, uh, the ones in the Atlantic are smaller. And so um, in, this, in an example here, we have uh, what's an invasive or introduced species is this Janolis that'll sometimes show up at the Blue Heron Bridge or at other, um, other dive sites in the area. And they can be quite big, sometimes up to two or three inches long. And uh, as a size comparison, we have another common bridge nudie, which is the, uh, which is the Flamidia benza. And this is kind of like a, uh, a life-size comparison. So you can see this adult one is maybe about the size of the rhinophores of this other nudie. And the rhinophores are these structures, um, are structures right here. I'm going to see if I have a laser pointer that I can, yeah. So these structures on the tops of these nudies are their noses and they're quite funny to think of them as noses because they flop around and some people think of them as bunny ears uh they're fantastic chemical sensory organs uh why should we care about these sea slugs um number one sea slugs are an indicator species uh they are a great representation of the water quality in an area and sometimes that water quality is not always good you know, these sea slugs eat the nutrients and detritus that's in the water. So while the water quality could be relatively poor, um, the sea slugs could be having a feast and they'll be, uh, I call it in bloom. You'll see thousands of them at the same dive. Uh, sea slugs are also super useful for medical research. A lot of the foundations of, um, of neuroscience are based off of sea slugs because they have such a simple neural pattern. Uh, some sea slugs, including sea hares, just maybe two neurons that, uh, that they use. So there's the foundation of neurobiology is uses sea slugs all the time, in, including some very interesting chemiomatics that they get out of the serratas on their back. Um, 
And the last option why we should care is that they are very beautiful and they are very easy subjects to take pictures of because they're kind of slow and uh, they're very colorful. And um, once you have the right tools, they are just a joy. So uh, why do I keep saying sea slugs uh, when everyone likes to use the term nudibranchs, right? Uh, see, some people say nudies. We've even advertised this talk as talking about nudies. And I like to use the term sea slugs because nudies is just like one of the five uh, little mini families of sea slugs that you'll find in the, you know, in the ocean. So you'll have the sacoglassians or sap sucking slugs. You'll have um, side gill slugs, um, head shield slugs, all sorts of different uh, things that are just at the same kind of taxonomic level is nudibranchs but uh so there's kind of this push in the science world to use the term sea slug to cover all of those instead of just giving all of the credit to the nudies and uh for an example here the the holy bible of the uh of the caribbean sea slug world is this book caribbean sea slugs and uh they refer to them as sea slugs right here in the in the title it's not to be cute it's to be inclusive and uh, the correct scientific term for sea slug is opisobranchs. So nudibranchs are just one family of opisobranchs. Um, how small? How small are they? Um, if you've never seen a sea slug before, you can be kind of surprised. Um, I like to say uh, to keep it in the Halloween theme um, that they can range in size from being a full-size candy bar to being a single piece of nerd's candy. So as an example, if let's say you have a single Kit Kat, that's about the length of this uh, Philomar Acreba that you'll find crawling around on the tops of the reef crests here on the reefs at about uh, 10 to 20 feet of water. And as opposed to this Tenelia tina or Cuthona tina, it was called a, sometimes the naming of these small ones changes quite frequently. Uh, this Tenelia tina was taken with a stacked uh two stacked nauticam diopters or close-up lenses and uh he's only about three millimeters in length the big boys uh this is godzilla he's a five maybe he even got to six inch long felomar picked up that lived at blue heron bridge last year for about four months and he lived on that same set of rocks and you couldn't miss him he was huge look at him and uh that's definitely the full size candy bar and if you're looking for these big boys these big dorid style nudibranchs uh that have the classic gill arches on the back and the rhinos here um you're going to be looking for them on the tops of uh the tops of kind of reefs. So like, let's say you're diving at Lauderdale by the sea and you just, you can even snorkel and look down at that area where it's maybe six to eight feet deep. Uh, you should be able to see this kind of jolt of yellow crawling along the tops. And that's the best place to find them and photograph them is because they'll be acting natural. They'll have all their gills out and um, do nice behaviors like sniffing. Uh, one other thing is I like this picture of Godzilla uh, because you can see his eyes quite well. Uh, nudies don't have very well-formed eyes. They're mostly eye spots that can tell light and maybe some shape differences. But uh, these, a lot of people will kind of make a little face for the nudies here with their oral tentacles being a mustache and little ears. But in fact, they have their eyes back here. So it's eyes, nose, and little fangs. <laughs> I think I think you're just so cute. The next size down, we got Tootsie Roll size nudies. We're still in this Dorid, uh, Dorid style nudibranch here. Um, the Felimar Julie, the Felimar Ruthe, and the Felimar Acriba are all uh, di at different times of year will kind of pop up on the reefs here, and and on sometimes on the shipwrecks as well. Um, in sets to uh, mate or um, feed. Generally, these nudies will have a lifespan of about one year to two years. And uh, they spend that first year as kind of like a flea, 
a free floating uh, veliger or like a free floating larva that some black water photographers uh, take pictures of. The next size down, these are your classic. Uh, if you go to Blue Heron Bridge, these are the classic size of nudies you'll find. They're about the size of an M&M, &M, so about two to four centimeters. And uh, the example I have here is a one Cretenna peregrina. And uh, if you see, we're going to go into the different kind of algaes to look for later. But it kind of gives you an, a sense of scale, how small these are. And this picture is fantastic. It was taken by my friend Tom Poff. And I, I literally save it on my phone to show people all the time because it gives you a real sense of scale. This is an adult uh, Flamidia binza, and he's crawling across this Bud Light cap. And I think a lot of people can probably identify how big that Bud Light logo is on a Bud Light cap. The next size down, grain of rice size. Now, this is where you start getting into the uh, seeing sea slugs on every single dive. So every on pretty much every dive that i go and say i'm going to go see a sea slug i will find you know some kind of eubrancus cochlea or some kind of uh undescribed elysia species that's either too small to identify or is an unidentified species they live everywhere and they're on everything so if you bring a little magnifying glass with you on your dives um there's a good chance that you'll find these. And I'm going to go into the specific techniques and how to find these a little bit later, but this just gives you an example. And there's nowhere that's not safe. You can find nudies even on the backs of seahorses. They live everywhere. And now for the smallest. This really gets into uh, almost too small to see territory, but with the right tools and the right amount of determination, you can start to see these, I call them semi-micro because they're less than one millimeter in size. Uh, for a sense of scale, this large metal um, kind of ring over here is your standard one inch key ring. And uh, this is the nudibrank inside. And this is was just taken with my bare macro lens. This is about as zoomed out as I can get using that lens. Um, and you can see the nudie here. And then once I put my magnifiers on the front of my camera, this is what pops up, a Tinelia Tina, 0.5 millimeters in size. Um, when I took this, it was by far the smallest I've ever found. I've found smaller, and uh, it, it really is cool when you realize that that speck moving around is a sea slug. Uh, I have some information here. For the curious, uh, I'm using a Sony 90 millimeter macro lens. This was with the Nauticam SMC1. Uh, and then I used some post-production. I used super resolution in Photoshop, and then I did a heavy crop, so I cropped in a lot. But this is as small as it gets. Any smaller, and you kind of need a microscope. So you're going on a dive. You're saying, I want to go look at nudies. Uh, your first strategy is to go slow. And I got this from one of my like very first uh, sea slug mentors. Um, Marcus. And uh, he said, imagine how fast you would normally swim. Now imagine swimming about half as fast as that. And then you can imagine swimming about half as fast as that. And now you're going about as fast as you need to go to find nudie. So you can imagine we're simply almost floating along, barely moving, uh, looking for these slugs. Uh, during a dedicated sea slug dive, um, because we won't be moving very much, we won't be exerting very much energy. So a normal scuba tank can last you two, three, or even four hours uh, at a shallow site, such as Lauderdale by the Sea or the Bridge. Uh, that leaves a lot of time for nudies, and frequently the you know the limiting factor on these dives is actually your camera battery. Uh, it's also important to maintain peak buoyancy. Um, since you're going to be so close to the seafloor and you're looking at such small stuff, uh, I found weighing myself so that my head is slightly down uh, can help me spot the sea slugs while keeping my body and my camera out of the way. Um, you also want to keep your fins up and off the bottom because if you stir that cell sediment, one, you're going to start to learn that, hey, I'm actually crushing sea slugs right now. Um, and two, it, it's, uh, it's just a very efficient way to dive. Uh, buoyancy floats, 
like the Styx floats that they sell at 4C are like a lifesaver for your camera or any lights that you have, because if you're going to be so close, you kind of, you don't ever want to set those down. So you, if those are kind of floating in the water column, uh, you won't have any trouble uh, maintaining a nice long dive without your wrist hurting. Uh, if you need any help with your uh, with your buoyancy, I'm going to give my 4C shout out right here. You can always ask your instructor uh, and you or sign up for a peak performance buoyancy class with Nicole, like I did. Um, and now the probably one of the best strategies is you want to memorize what the sea slugs eat. Um, as you learn what each sea slug is, uh, you'll start putting it together more. But uh, in general, Dorid nudibranchs, which are like the, the Felimarpicta Godzilla, those guys all eat sponges. And uh, the most delicious sponge on the reef by far is this famous blue sponge, Haliclona carulia. And it's, when I see one of these blue sponges out there, I feel like I won like a scratch off ticket or something because I know I'm going to find a sea slug in there. And you can see on this one a nice little uh, Felimar Julie going to town, head dug right in. He loves it. Aelid nudibranchs, which are the ones that have uh, the serrata or those kind of spindly things on their backs, they eat hydroids. And uh, on this picture, you can see what a hydroid is. It's their cousins of jellyfish, and they are animals that have little stinging cells and they look like little umbrellas. So you can see. We have hydroids here. Sacoglossians eat algae, and uh, sacoglossians are actually my favorite. Um, they're photosynthetic, so they take the chlorophyll out of algae and make it their own. So they'll eat this algae here. And head shield slugs, such as like the leechaglagia, they eat other slugs. So I like this picture because it shows you all the different kinds of foods you should look out for and what a sea slug looks like on the food. So, you, you know, you see a winning algae, uh, you see a, you know, a sponge out there, you know what to look for. Another strategy is you can look for their eggs. So because nudies and sea slugs are so small, they'll generally live on top of what they eat or what they hunt on. So you can... If you can't see the slug, but you can see their eggs, which are usually white ribbons or circles, then you know that you're getting close and you should look closer because you'll eventually find the slug that laid them. So now that we have the general strategies covered, I'm going to go into the specific kind of microbiomes that you want to be on the lookout for when you're hunting for slugs. Um, this first one I'm going to go into is the sand, because in South Florida, we have sand on pretty much every dive. Um, you can check the sand at the start of your dive, starting at about three to six feet of water. Um, when you are on the sand, think about the food that's available on it. Is there kind of dead algae floating around? Do you see um, detritus, or is it just like a normal flat sand bed? Because if it's just like plain sand like you know on some beaches where it's like really beautiful there's not really going to be that many slugs there but on dirty sand oh yeah you want dirty sand and uh the other the last tip is no matter how colorful the slug is they're all when you look down at the sand um, they're all going to look like small black dots and so if you're just cruising along at your very slow nudibranch hunting speed and you swim over and you see a small dot and then it starts moving, chances are you found a slug. And the first one I wanted to share with you guys is the flapping dingbat. Um, his scientific name is Gastropteron chakmol. These guys are the definition of little black dots. And I found them on almost every dive site down here in South Florida, especially the bridge. Um, What's special about them is they can swim. So they have these two little flappies here that lends to the flapping name uh, called parapoda. And when you kind of, when they get scared, and I've seen them even in the swim zone, like right underneath the, right underneath where the um, lifeguards are at Blue Heron Bridge. Uh, let's say a kid is playing in the water and almost steps on one. They will flap their wings and fly away. 
Uh, you can see they're in this two to five millimeter grain of rice size class um, when you compare it to the size of the hydroids here, which are just super tiny or this grains of sand, super small. Another one I like to see on the sand, very colorful, very common to South Florida is the leech of Lagia, Chilodonura hirundiniana. I always like to include the scientific names on things so that uh, people know because it's more precise than the common names. Um, these guys are predators. They're slug predators. And they, inside of their face here, they have, um, inside of their face here, they have this long kind of spear called a radula. And uh, they have these hypodermic needles that they use for sensing. So essentially, they're like a Velcro ball that'll just slug real fast or slither real fast, I guess, at their prey, bury their face in it and start spearing them. Um, they're really cool. Uh, they can also, they range in size. So I've heard of stories of people seeing them up to about an inch long. I would love to see one that size. Generally, I see them about the size of an M&M &M as compared to, you can see a Heineken cap here, um, thanks to the fishermen um, that like to leave their beer caps everywhere at the bridge. We get some nice sense of scale. And they have these beautiful colors. This swallow tail thing here on the back, this is their butt, and this is their face. They're a head shield slug. Um, I see Ariane in the comments. I hope I've gotten this identification correct because it's a new, uh, it's a newly described species. Previously, these were known as Dondus occidentalis, and then they were known as Nanuka occidentalis. But now with the separation of several of these species, I believe these are now uh, Dondus ariane. And uh, they were described in 2022, just a couple months ago. And uh, they were discovered essentially by Ariane Demetrius, who's also one of my sea slug mentors. I, I think she's there in the comments. So everyone say thanks, Ariane, for, <laughs> for discovering these or describing them as a different species because these are awesome. Um, these are extremely common on the reef, uh, and uh, not only on the reef, but on the sand and on the algae. You'll find these guys everywhere. They come out specifically on night dives. Um, so you'll, you'll uh, as soon as the sun goes down, let's say on your like typical 4C bridge night dive, uh, these guys will live in the sand and start popping up and they will start mating. They, these guys display the penis fencing that some uh, flatworms do. So they'll start trying to mate with each other and they'll stab each other and whichever one uh, gets stabbed ends up being the girl and has to lay the eggs. Uh, super cool. Um, and they're quite large. They can get up to two inches in length. And I have a, a picture to show you the scale over here. This is what they'll look like on a normal night dive, just cruising along in the sand. And now we're going to move on to the slugs that you'll find uh, that have to do with algae. So also classic in uh, the South Florida shore dives is you'll come across an algae bed after you pass by the sand. And we're all aware of the swim zone at the Blue Heron Bridge or those kind of Halamita algaes that are by Lario by the sea. Um, that's what I'm talking about here. So these are beds of bright green, beautiful algaes and seagrasses. Uh, you'll find them between 18 inches to 10 feet of depth. Um, you probably even go shallower, but then you're stepping on them, I guess. Um, a lot of the slugs that live in this algae area are photosynthetic. Um, and they do that either through kleptoplasty or they also maintain zooxanthellae, the same kind of zooxanthellae that's in the corals. Um, they use these chloroplasts to keep them alive and produce sugars. It's quite amazing. And they, that's why they live so shallow. Um, a hallmark for these is uh, there's going to be a lot of green. So get ready for it. And green's a great color. They very um, striking in pictures. Uh, a tip I have is you want to look for clean leaves. So when you're looking at algaes, you'll see a lot of them are quite messy, have a lot of 
dirt on them and then there's a random one that's just clean chances are something cleaned the leaf and uh if you don't find a different macro critter on there um there's a good chance you found a slug the first and most common one that i love to check are the green feather algaes coleoptera sertularoides uh these guys are all over the place they're on um typically found in that like three to six foot depth and uh they have ample opportunity for you to find critters on them at the bridge this is like where the seahorses live it's awesome uh a common one on there uh is luminandra nodosa or like the the warty nudibranch i think they call it uh these guys have this really awesome structures on their backs that have that form like little coils and uh along and they're distinguished by this orange ring that they have like kind of running behind their back and onto their heads they these guys you can see the individual zooxanthellae colonies inside their skin so that they gain a few of those sugars from the sun but these guys uh, are kind of omnivorous in that they will eat, also eat uh, the anemones that grow off of these leaves. So as they kind of crawl along, uh, the little baby anemones will start growing on the leaves, and these guys will go ahead and chow down. Uh, this is also where you'll find all the different kinds of sea hares. Um, they're cool, I guess. Most of them look brown, but I really wanted to show you this picture of what a you know what a sea hare would look like and what a sea slug looks like when it's perched on these leaves. It's it's quite obvious. Green leaf, boom, brown sea slug. So if you ever see like a brown sense of schmutz, yeah, uh, might as well take a look. The next kind of uh, algae or grass I'll talk about is manatee grass. Uh, this is also everywhere. It's slightly deeper um generally like maybe six to 20 feet of depth and you'll find slugs at all of those depths i like to find the slugs around 20 feet deep if you can find this grass especially when it's like thickly matted uh one of the ones i see on there is ercolania verdris these guys crawl up and down those very slender stalks and they eat the chloroplasts right here uh just off of the off of the plant and then it they take them and instead of destroying the chloroplasts or digesting them it they put it into these serrata on their back and then they use these serratas like leaves and they will do uh photosynthesis so they don't eat any kind of um they don't eat any animals they're not predators and uh these this is an example of uh, a sacoglossian slug so this is not a nudibranch this is i think super pretty one of the most pretty things in this area and uh they're found on the manatee grass this one is about three or four millimeters across another common one this one is super common down in the keys elysia crispata or the lettuce slug um scientists thought that these were actually like several different kinds of species until they did some genomic testing realized they're all the same so sometimes people call these elysia clarkey uh, they're actually all now Elysia crispata, and uh, they have these great folds on the back of their on the back of their bodies where they store more of those chloroplasts, so they can make more food. And um, side note: when you do see them, they will be shockingly green, and sometimes they'll hang around on like brown substrate. So they're probably one of the easiest ones to spot. This one on the right-hand side of the screen um, is maybe three inches long. They get quite big. And this one over here was maybe only uh, 20 centimeters or so, so quite small. They range in size. Um, the next kind of algae you want to look out for when you're really looking for slugs is the paddle blade algae. This is under the family Everine Vila. Um, sometimes these are referred to as mermaid fans. And uh, when you look at these, this uh, you really want to look for little fuzzballs, little orange fuzzballs on the outsides. Um, there, because that's a little surprise for you, and it's probably going to be one of my favorite slugs, the eye spot, 
Costa Ciela. Uh, so they're referred to as Sean the Sheep. They're probably one of the most famous sea slugs in the world. Um, the one that's like off of Japan called Costa Ciela Karashime is like super white and has like super light green. It just looks super like clean. But the ones here are nice and colorful. Um, they range in size from maybe 20 centimeters, like for a really, really big one, all the way down to the babies, just four millimeters in size. Uh, they they call them Shaun the Sheep because they look like the British cartoon character, Shaun the Sheep. I wish I had put an image of Shaun in here so that you could see, but they are hilarious. Uh, they have... Um, they're, you know, the rhinophores that they have here just look look just like big floppy ears. And these cartoon eyes are uh, not quite good at seeing anything other than light and shadow. Uh, so make sure to check out that paddle leaf algae whenever you see it. I spend 10 minutes of every dive looking and make, hoping to see one of these just, just in case. This is a very common one for the area, uh, the bristle brush algae. Uh, this one, all throughout the bridge, maybe like three to six feet of depth. And you're going to be looking for slugs just sitting right on top, just like this Elysia right here. Uh, you'll see them just crawling around, and uh, it's like a gimme. Actually, I think in this picture here, there's a slug right here. One of the ones you'll see on the bristle brush algae is Elysia pretensis. This is the lined Elysia. You can see an example of that kind of egg spiral that they would do. Now, this is on turtle grass, but uh, they particularly love to live on those bristle brush algaes. And uh, you can imagine seeing how well they blend in using those lines to just look like part of the algae. But it's easy. You just go right up to the algae, get your face you know, five to six inches away and take a look. I think this is the last algae I'm talking about, the Halamita algae. So the Halamita algae has a calcium skeleton inside. That's the one where if you accidentally break it, um, there'll, there'll be like a bone. Uh, it's pretty it's cool, creepy Halloween theme. On those guys, my favorite slug is the Elysia ornata. And He's super green because he's photosynthetic as well. Um, they range in size from about one inch to about 10 millimeters in length, depending on how old the one is that you found. Uh, and they have these very distinctive orange tips on their parapoda and on the rhinophores on their front there. So when you stare at the Halamita algae, one, they're typically clean. And then two, you'll see the orange and it'll be like, there's my slug. There he is. Uh, fun fact about these, uh, there's been some recent research done on them where uh, when their heads are cut off, they can go on and regrow their entire bodies from just like the fronts of their heads. <laughs> Super cool. And now for the probably like the best place to find nudies on your South Florida dive is like the rubble. And the rubble is special um, because it's where nocturnal nudies will go to hide during the day. Um, there's underneath that first layer of uh, like sh broken shells or dead coral, little rocks, maybe the size of a seashell, uh, encrusting sponges will grow. And some of the most colorful species in our areas uh, live in and around the rubble. Um, before we go into the rubble, I want to talk about a somewhat controversial topic of flipping rocks, right? Uh, if you don't want to flip rocks, there's actually no need to flip the rocks. These slugs are out early in the morning or at night. So if you only want to look at slugs on the surface or you're not, you don't feel comfortable touching the substrate, um, go right ahead and like, you'll, you'll see them. They're there. Uh, generally, if I choose to touch the rocks, um, I never flip anything bigger than a seashell. Um, and only if there's no animal such as a hydroid or uh, sponge on top. Uh, the nudies that we're looking at here stay really close to the surface. 
So just on that first layer, there's no need to dig around in there. And uh, obviously, once you're done looking at the bottom of a rock, you can place it right back where it was found. And this is why you want to look at the rocks. This is some pe most people's favorite at the bridge, the Harlequin Sea Goddess, uh, Flamidia Binza. They are red, they're colorful, and they're, uh, they're actually quite common once you know how to see them. Uh, that's a, the technique that you can use reliably is just you pick up a, a, a seashell in like a little rubble bed and flip it over. And I want to say maybe get like one or two each dive. They're beautiful. Another one is the gold line sea goddess. We saw some pictures of these before and they're currently, you can see these guys at the bridge right now, right on the surface. You don't need to dig. They're currently going through uh, their mating here. So this is a picture of two of them really going at it. And uh, it was it's so interesting because there was, you know, you saw one, you saw two, and now there's, uh, I think I saw 100 on that day. It was awesome. So uh, next to the rubble, I guess I'd say rubble adjacent, um, a lot of this is where like hydroids will grow in large tufts right next to the rubble and about, you know, just between three and six inches off of the rubble on these hydroid tufts, you'll find the ailed nudibranchs going to town and eating those uh, analogous, you know, not, you know, not uh, jellyfish called hydroids. And the most common one by far at the bridge is Flabellina ducia. You can find these guys in most of the shady spots around uh, the Blue Heron Bridge. And they take the stinging cells, the nematocysts, from these hydroids. And they put them into the serrata on their back so that when they feel threatened, they can like kind of arch their backs and shoot the stinging cells, which you can see here, at... Uh, you know, whatever is threatening them. And that's, of course, if they don't get scared off by the aposmatic coloration. Another one related to the Ducia is Cretina peregrina. There, you can see how big it is uh, in comparison to uh, this algae it's close to. Uh, you can tell the difference between the Cretina peregrina and the Ducia because they have these super cute face paints on their face. Uh, I also think Cretanas have a lot more personality than the Ducias for whatever reason. Um, but just look at that face. You can see the eye spot and this little, little mouth there. Another one in the hydroids, the Plucum forest leucanesis, Plucomorpheus leucanesis. Uh, these guys have a beard um, and they like to rear up. So they have a really funny face here with their rhinophores forming little ears and this beard around their face. Uh, these guys get kind of big. Uh, the plocas maybe an inch or two inches each, but they love to live really deep into this red hydroid, red tufted hydroid that really stings if you get too close. Um, they come out at night. And one of your best bets is to like find this tufted hydroid that's about the size of maybe a volleyball and shine your light into it and you'll see the and you'll see the plocas um shadow through it then you know you found it also on the hydroids which is a good example here of the kind of hydroids you're looking for uh lomatomus vermiformis so these guys try and look like the hydroids that they live on and they have this really cool electric pattern on their body that they use to kind of camouflage themselves from predators. Uh, and they say they just mun they're just munching away. That's what all these nudies do. They just eat all day and mate. And uh, I, yeah, the dodos. So once you're looking at hydroids and tufts of hydroids on the rubble, you're gonna find a lot of these. I'm gonna be real with you. I don't try and identify all of them because they're they just uh that's the limit of my <laughs> of my identification skills but they're uh they're defined by these like grape clusters on their backs they they're super striking and they 
and you think that they're just like a little piece of organic dirt, but really they're sea slugs. And they're fun fact, it's like the first sea slug I ever found on my own was one of these. Uh, they have these very uh, distinct rhino rhinophoral sheaths. So it looks like a little sleeve and then like they're sticking a little stick out of there. And uh, yeah, they're quite fun. So if I if someone ever bets me, hey, can you go find a nudie? I know I can probably find a dodo to show them. And the last one I wanted to share with you uh, for, well, for nudies to look out for in this area is the Genolus flavo anilatus, which is a invasive, or some people say introduced species uh, to Florida. So this is native to the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific. And it looks like someone maybe emptied their fish tank, not unlike the lionfish. And uh, these big, beautiful <laughs> sea slugs are the result. They typically only live for a couple of weeks once they reach this kind of critical mass size. So there'll be a dozen of them at once living on the hydroids, and then they'll disappear without a trace. They'll just be gone. Um, and uh, that's definitely something to look out for. They have their purple, their yellow. They are something else that doesn't look like anything else we have here. But uh, definitely look out for these. Uh, something I wanted to share, if you want to learn more about sea slugs, uh, there's a couple Facebook groups you can check out, Macro Hunters of the Americas, um, or you can buy these books. I know, I think both of these are available at 4SE, but uh, Caribbean Sea Slugs is considered like the gold standard. It's getting a little bit old, so some of the references in there are outdated, but if you Google it, it'll show you. And uh, this one is the most up-to-date book. Um, and I mean up-to-date because it was released like yesterday. Caribbean Reef Life, the version 4, has all of these sea slugs and more. I think it has like nearly 300 sea slugs in there. Um, definitely check out both of those books. And uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on this journey and learning about uh, how to find sea slugs and some actionable advice that you can use. Um, and as a present, uh, this is a picture of my corgi dressed up as the Flabellina Ducia for Halloween, hanging out with his Flabellina friends. All right. Thank you so much, Gabe. Wow. Amazing photography. Fantastic. And we just want to make sure these were all shot in Florida, right? These were all shot. Actually, I tried to only take pictures that I took either at um, either at Lauderdale by the Sea or at the Blue Heron Bridge. So two awesome. common shore dives right next to four sea locations. And um, you know, we're we're talking about these, and uh, they wanted to know. You probably don't go out specifically trying to find a certain nude break you go out and you just find them right or or can you pinpoint oh i want to go see this particular one because i've heard it's here so i'll i'll i do both right there is typically you can go out with an idea of um you know you hear reports that someone saw one of these and so what i'll do is if it's something i haven't seen before i'll read up on what it eats and equip myself with the knowledge of going to find what it eats and then going on a mission to go find it. But while I'm doing that, I also keep my eyes peeled for all the other slugs that I might see. Because if I pass by a like a blue sponge, I'm not going to just not look at it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, of course, they know that some of these are at the Blue Heron Bridge. So they wanted to know, are there better times of the year to find nudibranchs at the bridge? Or is it a year round? That's the best part. Because there's more than 400 species here, they all have different times of year that they are kind of in bloom, so to speak. So <clears throat> given the time of year, if you go to the algae, if you don't find one style, you're going to find a different style. So um, like, let's say that you were, that I was seeing a bunch of those Limonadra nodosas at some point in time. Well, when those are gone, they'll, then you'll see a bunch of the uh, Dondus ariane out there it's just it's uh it's really special um yeah and they they wanted to know if you are at the bridge do you find more on the east side or on the west side 
actually you can find them equally uh, on both sides. I will say the ones on the west side are bigger. Um, but I find a surprising amount of them actually in the seagrass area, which is why it's super important not to like kneel or touch the seagrasses when they're there. Awesome. So I'm going to share my little databank story. And actually, if Ariane, if you're still watching, she was involved in this. Uh, when I first started diving the bridge, um, I used to think it was um, fun to take my stickle stick and I would flip the because I didn't realize that the upside down jellyfish were supposed to be upside down. I thought they were like <laughs> just disorientated. So I would flip them. And the one time I was diving and I noticed a nudibranch living inside the little jellyfish. And I actually ran into Ariane and she's come to 4C and I told her about it. She's like, oh my gosh, you found that? So then I had to go out and she had to go out and try and find it because they were trying to identify that particular species because it's not very common here. It's common down in the Caribbean. Um, but I, I know that she was trying to get that one identified. And so again, you never know what you're going to find a nudibranch hanging on to. You showed the pictures of them, you know, on the, uh, the seahorse, um, sometimes in the, the, the sea stars, like the, the big, uh, cushion sea stars, you might find them. So definitely it's worth a look. And, uh, so obviously people, um, people want to know. You know, what kind of lens do you use? Do you use a diopter to get these little itty bitty photos? Yes, actually. So um, I I shoot a Sony A6500, actually the same camera that you shoot, Nicole, uh, in a Nauticam housing. And uh, I use the Sony 90 millimeter lens. And because it's a crop sensor, I actually get a cool 135 millimeters of macro lens, which is great. It does extend my working distance somewhat, but that just means that I can like cut that working distance down with very powerful diopters or technically called close-up lenses they're measured in diopters um for a lot of these i actually use quite a weak one the nauticam cmc2 uh those ones are that kind of like slightly weaker one that's equivalent to like maybe a plus eight or nine in another manufacturer is uh good for like the m and m size ones and then for the truly tiny ones i just picked up a nauticam smc2 which is uh, super powerful. For a lot of the ones at the beginning of this presentation, um, like the all the Felimars or the or the Pictas, you can actually use the that new backscatter macro lens that goes on your GoPro, and you can get some pretty cool video of those. It's just the right size. Awesome. And obviously, if you guys have more um, questions about photography and macro photography, a good resource is to go to the Underwater Photography Society. Um, it's the South Florida one that's here in um, the you guys meet in Pompano Beach area um, the second Tuesday of every month. They do in-person presentations. And also, if you're not able to attend, you can watch it on Facebook, I think. Right, Gabe? Yeah, that's right. I do see a question in the crowd um, from Lawrence, actually. How can I learn more about sea slugs that utilize zooxanthellae? And I actually have another book. I have a whole library of sea slug books right here. So I'm going to take a quick look, and I think I see it. <laughs> this one, I I definitely saw this one at the, at the Riviera Beach location. But Nudibranch Behavior by David Behrens. Oh, this one is perfect it teaches you all like all about those kind of um the sea sluggy facts that make sea slugs special especially how they use zooxanthellae you'll find that most sea slugs actually have zooxanthellae in their bodies uh even the colorful ones that live on sponges awesome all right well guys um it, it is time to Let's see, I'm gonna hide this slide. I'm gonna bring this one in. Uh, go over to our website. Like I said, if you guys are interested in what's going on with 4C, you go to our um, events tab, click it, and then you get this page. And like, you get all this musical snacks of Facebook Lives and dives and presentations and trips. So we have a lot of things planned. I haven't put up um, some of my November stuff yet. I promise it'll get up there in the next two days. Um, but if you want to learn more about um, 
doing tech of the um, tech diving. We've got tech month this month. And also we have some wetsuit deals online. So if you are looking for a nice warm wetsuit so you can go out and look for new to Brinks, go ahead and go to our website or come into the stores and we'll get you suited up. All right. So then you guys, I promised we were going to do some air fills. So I'm going to go ahead and do the random name picker and we're going to see who our big winner is. I'm going to gift you two air fills and it goes to Lance. Lance, are you watching? Lippincott? Hopefully I said your name right. Lance, if you're watching, give us thumbs up. Let us know you're excited that you won some air fills. I will reach out to you via email and uh, you can figure out how to use those. Let's go ahead. I'm feeling um, generous again. So let's do two more air fills. Two. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, Randy, Randy, you guys, uh, he's on, almost watches every single Facebook Live. So thank you, Randy, for being a great supporter. And we're going to reward you with some air fills. All right. So guys, um, if you want to learn more or see some more photography from our guest presenter, Gabe Jensen, you can go to his Instagram page, which is? Chelsea's Gallery. All right. And I... Uh, Obviously, he gives us some um, content. So if you watch the Instagram or Facebook pages, we usually uh, we tag him in them so you can see some of his other photos because he doesn't do just new to Branks. He has some other great photography skills. So he's a wealth of knowledge. He dives a lot at our stores. So hopefully you get to meet him in person and see him out there on the wrecks and reefs. And um, let's go diving, guys. Let's go find some nudies. <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in. Everyone say thank you to Gabe and have a great evening. See ya. Thanks, guys. <laughs>